All right, Father God, I just um, thank you for this this time. <clears throat> I just I just offer up my heart to you, Lord. I offer up my mind to you. I offer up my my mouth, Lord, for you just to speak through right now. And uh, I just thank you, Holy Spirit, for your presence, um, for your help. I just pray, Lord, that only uh, what you want to say would would be said, Lord, and it would just go forth. And um, just have your way, Lord. Your will be done. Your kingdom come. And um, we just we just thank you for this message and this time. So I, I thank uh, Pastor Jack Hayford for his input, and um, as well as my great uncle Roland Buck. So um, I want to talk about the importance of the Lord's table, my experience with celebrating it, um, scriptures about it, references from his, the book that we're reading, um, you know, self-examination, how to take it unworthily so we know what not to do, um, how to take it worthily, um, take commu- for a fresh Pentecost, old versus new covenant, oh yeah, um, what is atonement, there's, there's nine meanings in that word. Um, Holy Spirit on communion, discerning the body, which is like a major, major key of how to take it worthily. And, and then we, we're going to partake it together and make celebratory declarations and praise and thanksgiving together. So the importance of the Lord's table, um, Roland Buck was a pastor in the, for about 30 years in Idaho. And um, the angel Gabriel visited him 27 separate times. And every time... And Gabriel was actually at the atonement sacrifice since it started, every, every one. So, and, and he shared with him um, these messages, and this is a quote from him. Regardless of the message that God has spoken to me about through this heavenly messenger, they all come back to one central truth that has proven to be the very heart of God, the heart of the Bible, the heart of all history. It's at the very core, at the very center of God's message to us, and that is the sacrifice of Jesus. And uh, this message of atonement will prepare us for uh, the return of Christ. Um, there are seven festivals that they celebrate, that Israel cel- celebrates. Um, the festival of atonement um, is, is the one that will prepare us for the next one, which is tabernacle, when he's going to come back and tabernacle with us. So we need to get this message in our heart. This is the gospel. Um, so my experience in celebrating communion, and, so, and I'm, I might repeat a little bit here and there, but that's okay, because... There's just, we, it's good to hear it more than once. So some of the things I'm, I'm sharing here, I'm going to share, share, share again. But um, Isaiah 53, 4-7, Surely he has borne our griefs, carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement that brought us peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. And that word healed is um, also could, is means made whole. So we're made whole by his stripes. Um, there's provision in, this, in his sacrifice for all three parts of us, body, soul, and spirit. I had some emotional turmoil from like, a breakup. I'm, I'm sure other people have experienced that. And um, I just was like, I took communion you know, that day. I was like, Lord, you just bore this. You bore this on the cross and, and for about an hour or so. I was just thanking him and praising him and, and by faith. After that hour was up, it was gone. I had no more term, turmoil. So he, he made me whole. He, he took away the, the damage, hurt emotions. Um, he healed my mind. Um, I was taking uh, communion a lot last year and just thanking the Lord in faith that he bore mo- all my mental liabilities. And um, I was diagnosed with bipolar. I was taking meds for 17 years. And I just I tapered off last November successfully. And um, I, don't, I don't just give credit to... The, a point of return for the supplements. I, I give credit to the Lord. I was taking communion. I was like thanking the Lord that He bore it on the cross. He took it, and um, and so it's been three months, and I just thank the Lord for that. He can heal body, everything in our body, um, and then healing and freedom from accusations of past sins and failures. One of the things that the blood does is it purges our conscience. Um, you know, there was some. I'm sure everyone has some things that they wish they did not do or could take back. And, um, you know, there was something when I was, like, really young that happened, and uh, I won't go into detail about it, but I was, I had a lot of shame about it, and I was just, I was worried. I actually read a tract one day, and it, and it, it said, like, all of our sins were going to be broadcast in heaven, and, like, everyone's going to see, and um, I was just worried. I was like, oh, no, like, I don't want everyone to see that, and, um, but I just thank God that that's not true. Um, he's only recording the good stuff for us. He's only going to give a, you know, well done for, 
for the unbeliever, it's different. But for us, um, he's only going to be rewarding us. It's going to be a judgment for rewards. Um, there's no condemnation in it. He's going to remove the chaff in an instant. Um, and so that this message really set me free, this truth of what I'm going to go into more um, later that purged my conscience. I'm, I'm completely free from all guilt. So I just thank God for that. Um, receive great joy many times. Um, there's joy in communion. Um, there was one time when I was with my band, Circle Sight, and we were leading worship for a, a group up in uh, Big Bear at one time. And uh, we took communion, and we just had joy break out among us. And we just couldn't stop laughing um, for, like, half the day. It was amazing. Um, and even, like, the next day, it was just... So there's joy. There's joy in, uh, in communion. This is the atonement diagram. This actually is in the book Angel on Assignment. I really recommend every believer, everyone, to read it. But this is from God's viewpoint. This is one of the things that I meditated on during communion when I was taking it. I was thinking about this, these truths. So the atonement, that represents the blood. <clears throat> and then this is God's viewpoint. And he sees us looking under that. For those of us who've accepted Christ... He sees us looking unblameable, holy, and unreprovable in his sight. Instead of sin, fault, and failure, because everyone has sin, fault, and failure. We, we come under the covering when we accept what he did for us on the cross. And so, instead of this stuff, he sees us looking holy. He sees us looking like Jesus. Um, for people that have not accepted the Lord, the, the Father sees all the sin and fault and failure. And so... There's no covering for them, and they won't be ready when he comes. So we got to get under the covering. But you get under the covering by accepting Christ. You stay under the covering by keeping in fellowship with him. <clears throat> and so here, here's some of the scriptures, Matthew 26, 26. Now, as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink uh, all of it. A drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So I want to talk about what covenant is, too, as well. Um, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant. In my blood, do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as, for as often as you drink it and eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without, that's the key, without discerning the body. So we're going to learn about, how, we're going to learn how to discern the body. Whoever does it without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. So what is covenant? A covenant is a formal promise made under sacred oath while solemnly calling on God to witness and enact the covenant. The covenant ceremony included a covenant meal. The covenant meal included drinking red wine to represent partaking of, partaking of each other's life and eating bread to symbolize partaking of each other's nature. The tradition of the bride and groom cutting the wedding cake and feeding it to each other is actually acting out this ancient rite of covenant. This is my body. That's, and then all of God's interaction with us is based on covenant. Jesus cut a new covenant with the Father on our behalf through the shedding of his own blood and tearing of his own flesh. And we, we partake of his nature now. We get to share his nature, partaking of his divine nature. And when we take communion, we are... We are there's real life. It's not just a symbol. It's, it is a symbol, but as we, as we interact with God and as we remember, as we're thanking Him and praising Him, as we're in His presence, there's a real, literal, His life it's, comes and flows. He, he's present. He's present when we, when we do it. And, and so if you want more life, just take communion more. You can do it every day. So a blood covenant ceremony included a walk through death in which animals were killed and cut in half with the halves laid out on either side of the Nile down the middle. The covenant partners would then walk a figure eight through the halves of the animal carcasses while reciting solemn vows calling on God as witness. So that's interesting, the figure eight. It's, eight is like the number of new beginnings and it's like eternal, eternity, eternal, you know, there's no end. God made an eternal covenant with us. He's given us a new beginning. 
Um, he did this with Abraham, too, in Genesis 15. Um, the walk through death represented a dying to their former life and beginning a new life as one with their covenant partner. From this moment on, they counted themselves dead to their former life and, and alive to a new life with their covenant partner. So here's some references from living the spirit form life. Um, so communion is a time to commemorate his announcement that it is finished. Celebration of his triumph over sin, death, and the powers of darkness. Revelation 12:11. they overcame him, the enemy, by the blood of the Lamb. <laughs> Celebrating the victory won, and that is currently avail available for us now. The Eucharist is derived from, I think, so thanksgiving is the central focus of our response to be praiseful in a tone of victory. And uh, the atmosphere of remembrance at the Lord's table is to be one of feasting and celebrating the victory. And uh, communion is derived from the word koinonia, which emphasizes in celebrating communion, we are mutually sharing God's life. And uh, we're drinking to celebrate a redemption that covers our past, present, and what's to come. And um, Jack Hayford was, said, I'll drink to that irreverently. You know. uh. <laughs> this blood is for you. So strength for the journey. Israel's deliverance from Egypt is another illustration of the dyna dynamics of the Lord's table. So communion, as you know, it was Passover back then. So Hebrews placed the blood of the lamb on the doorways. They ate the flesh of the sacrifice, the lamb, in order to gain strength for the coming journey. Psalms uh, 105 says they, none of them were feeble. That's amazing. So um, we need strength for the journey. Every time we, we, we receive his strength. And he gave Passover as a law because there's no life in an individual without partaking of Jesus. You know, Jesus told them in the desert, you have no life in you if you do not take, if you do not partake of his life and eat of his, drink his blood and eat his flesh, you have no life in you. God, um, they use the blood for protection. They use the body for food for their physical health. As people who are being delivered, we need nourishment and strength for our journey. At the Lord's table, we acknowledge our dependence and draw on God-ordained resources in Christ. Um, Isaiah 53, 4, by stripes we are healed. So some in Acts, they were not discerning the, the Lord's body, so they were weak. And uh, when we partake of his life, then we are not only taking the blood, but of the virtues of his body. In atonement, God made provision for the health of the body. When we are in God's presence and we take the full focus of what he intended through communion, we receive emotional healing, physical healing, and spiritual healing. And Paul prayed in 1 Corinthians 5, I pray, God, that your whole spirit, soul, and body will be preserved. Um, dokimazo, it's a Greek word, the word examine, when it says let a man examine himself to see, is uh, descriptive for running a test. So we have to test our own hearts toward the Lord and one another. Um, releasing forgiveness to one another is not just something to do during communion service. It's a commandment from our, our master. But if you have a better route towards someone, you still need to take communion so you can receive the power of the blood of Jesus to free you from it. If you're struggling with something, you, you, go, you need to take communion to receive life so to help you overcome. Um, so say you can't come to the Lord's peak table because you sin is equivalent to saying to a starving man, you can't eat any food until you get over your malnutrition. It doesn't make sense. So when we mess up, it's actually wise to go take communion to proclaim the victory and to receive fresh life and help to, to free us. Um, so, and this is second, I won't go too much into this, Second Chronicles 30, 17 to 23, there's a story about um, some of the children of Israel that um, they partake of the communion without doing the purification. And so it, it just reveals to us that God is more interested in people than he is in procedure. He was more interested in getting people into taking communion and getting his life to than, than all of the, the procedure and the rules. And Hezekiah prayed and God revealed his heart by healing the people. And they even defied the tradition. Instead of seven days of feasting, they went another week. And the gladness, joy increased because God had forgiven the people even bypassing what looked like his own regulations in doing it. When he says, let a man examine himself and so let him eat, he's letting a man examine himself to see whether he's putting his faith in that blood. So God isn't looking for reasons to reject us or condemn us, but he's looking to bring us for re reason to bring us in. He came that we might have life. Uh, the first 1,750 years of the Christian experience, they didn't teach that. That didn't start until the last part of the 1800s. Somebody got an idea where they needed to start putting people with that. And then all of a sudden, people started saying, you gotta struggle and climb to a place of perfection before you can even take the life. It's as much as saying you need to be strong and perfect before you're even alive. <clears throat> so who is worthy to take communion? 
No one is. We're all unworthy. Um, none of us has ever been worthy to, of what he's done for us. So the word worthy, ek axios, this is according to Jack Hayford, um, draws on the concept of worthiness as it had to do with weight, like the worthiness of a coin. If a coin was very worthy, it was like weighty, it was heavy. So it, it's not, not dealing with perfection. No one is perfect. So Paul is saying when you come to the Lord's table, bring the full weight of your understanding and faith. So come to this moment recognizing the full weight and full worth of what Christ has done for you at Calvary. And um, Paul talked about it, and, you know, there are some people that were just hungry, or they were just getting drunk. They, they weren't bringing their understanding or their faith to the communion supper. So they, they weren't really partaking of the life because they weren't bringing their faith and their understanding. They, so it, it wasn't doing any, having any good effect for them. So they stayed in their state of condemnation. You know, everyone, everyone's already condemned before they come to Christ. So they just stayed in that state because they didn't come with... The, the weight of the understanding of the faith of, and what Jesus did on the cross and what we're going to talk about here. So that's what he was talking about. So how to take it unworthily. So when you put your faith in anything else outside of the blood of Jesus, when you're, asked, when you're saying it's because I've examined myself, I haven't done anything bad here, and if I had done something bad here, I've asked the Lord to forgive it, and I guess everything's clear, I can partake. That's how to take it unworthily. Uh, we're saved by grace, not by works. Um, when you partake only because you're hungry or to get drunk, uh, when you don't bring the weight of your understanding and faith in Jesus and his sacrifice, that's how to do it unworthily. So how to take it worthily is when you put your faith in the blood of Jesus and when you bring the weight of, of your understanding and faith and when you bring your thanksgiving and praise for the victory that Jesus accomplished at Calvary and when you put your faith in um, what Jesus has done and take the cup and by that act, act of taking the cup, you're, you're saying something to God that you haven't been able to say in any other way. And uh, you're saying, God, I'm putting my faith in what this cup symbolizes, the blood of Jesus. And then you acknowledge that this is your source of life. That's how you do it. And um, we need to take communion for God's highest purpose to be revealed, in, in, I mean, to be fulfilled in us, which is to become like Jesus. That's God's highest purpose for everyone, that we become like him. And, how, and what is he like? He is loving, he's joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and he's, he mastered the Beatitudes perfectly. And um, Take communion for a fresh Pentecost. You know, Acts 1.8, you shall be witness unto, unto me. When, pe when people see you, they will know that I'm alive because my nature is beaming out from you. My life is within you. Um, the highest purpose of this, the coming of the Holy Spirit is to glorify Jesus in our lives. So, and according to Galatians 5.22, the nature of Jesus that the Spirit grows in you is love, joy, peace, gentleness, long-suffering, goodness, meekness, faith. He said there's no law on earth or in heaven that's against a person being like Jesus. So that is what God wants us to be. So it's a key to becoming like him, the Holy Spirit forming and, and embodying the likeness of Jesus within us. And the Holy Spirit comes when a person puts their faith in the blood. So we ask, well, we've got to take communion so the Holy Spirit can come. And the nature of Christ is formed in your spirit is one of the only few things you can take with you into, into eternity. Um, some of the benefits, and I, I'm going to go more in later, but reconciliation, justification from the cross, that means just as if it had never happened in God's sight, our sins. Restoration, um, joy, Jesus said, come for joy. He's, he spoke those things to us that we might have joy. Freedom, um, confidence to approach the throne of grace with boldness. Uh, peace, life. He's come that we might have life and life more abundantly. Uh, health and healing and constant cleansing. As we walk in the light as he is in the light, the blood cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And he is the light. That light in that verse isn't talking about knowledge, like walking in all the bit of knowledge that you have, because then that would imply you're earning it, and we can't earn it. So it's, it's life. Um, it's the, I mean, it's light. God is light. So we have to just stay in the light, keep in fellowship. And then all the things that went on the cross was on the body of Jesus. This is, this is we're getting, starting to get into the discerning his body now. It is the wrath of God, sorrow and grief, sin and iniquity, shame and guilt, curses, sickness, judgments, unbelief, accusations, condemnation, hate, bitterness, and death. Jesus bore it all. He bore it all. Like the cross is like the eternal garbage bin of all time. Discerning the body. So this is what we need to learn. So for those who eat and drink without discerning, that's 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 this, we're gonna learn how to do this. What is it? What is so important about recognizing and seeing this body? 
We must go back to the sacrifices of Israel in the tabernacle to see the value of these sacrifices, to see what they were. Now God told Moses um, how to do the tabernacle, and everything had to be perfect because it showed what Jesus was going to be doing for us. <clears throat> and it was God's great big plan of salvation for all time. And the first thing inside the tabernacle was a brazen altar upon which a sacrifice was to be burned to ashes. And those ashes would be sprinkled, sprinkled on the individual who was going to be accepted by God. This is just an illustration of what happens to our sins. They just become ashes. And it took, there's two animals there because it took two animals. In Leviticus 16, it talks about this to show what, about this, um, about what Jesus did for us. Um, the goat, the high priest would, would pl pronounce all the sins of Israel on the goat and would release the goat into a place, into a wilderness where it could never be found and it would eventually die in a forgotten, abandoned wilderness place. That was one animal. And another animal, the lamb, was, was burned to ashes. So that sacrifice had to feel the searing heat of judgment by fire. And on that sacrifice, all the sins of Israel were placed. And uh, when Israel became to be accepted and the ashes were sprinkled along with the blood, God was saying to Israel, you have given me your sins. I'm giving back to you now and letting you see the ashes of something that has lost its power. It's been reduced to nothing. Um, Hebrews 9 through 13, 14. The, um, the Holy Spirit is saying through Paul, if the ashes of a heifer, as they discern the body where, where their sins were accounted on that animal, and if that gave them freedom for that whole year, Paul said, how much more shall the blood of Christ in his sacrifice purge your conscience and completely remove from your mind and your emotions? How much more shall what Jesus did, his, being, his body being struck by the righteous judgment of God? And he said, we, we can discern and see his body there. How much more will it purge your conscience so that when the enemy would come your way and haunt you with stuff, you can point to the body and say, Satan, take that. You know, those sins you're trying to haunt me with are nothing but burned out ashes. Sin shall not have dominion over me. It's lost its power. We, we take it and we proclaim the death. We proclaim the benefits of his death every time we take. So the fire of judgment has been diverted from us to a substitute. And our, and our sins were there on the body of that substitute. And they were destroyed as the judgment of God struck. So God has set aside a time that we can come and look and be reminded again and again that it's done. The price is paid. His wrath has been diverted to Jesus and our sins were judged when he was judged. Our sins have already been judged. Past, present, and future. Every, every life, every person, whoever was born and whoever will be born, has, all of them were already placed by God 2,000 years ago. It's already done. It's already happened. But not everybody has accepted it. Not every, it's, it's already been provided for. It's like God is, can, ha, has a reservation for everyone. He's not willing that any should perish, but all that should come to the saving knowledge of Jesus. And so it, it, we have to get this message out to tell people, the good news, you can come now. You know, it's been done. Your sins have already been judged. They were placed on Jesus. And, and they can just, they can look up and, and they can be saved by calling on his name or looking to him, uh, coming to him by faith. So what did Jesus experience on the cross? He suffered pains that the ungodly have never, have never experienced on the cross. Because the ungodly, who, who are still alive on this earth, they have never heard heard the words depart from me into eternal damnation. They've never felt that hopelessness that some will feel during the white throne judgment. Um, Jesus suffered the torment of a damned soul and he cried out, oh God, why have you forsaken me? He tasted hell for us and it was the outpouring of God's judgment upon Jesus. So Jesus suffered the judgment of God for everybody. He literally became our substitute. And it was us to feel the separation for, from the sting, but he did it. He came to taste death for everyone, not physical death, because we're still going to have to die unless we're here when Jesus comes. He came so that he could taste that total separation from God, that eternal seeking of the Son into an eternal darkness. Jesus felt the eternal damnation in his body, but because of the power of that blood and the power of a sinless life, death could not hold him. And that is actually the power that raised him from the dead. It was his blood. <coughs> Zechariah 3, 1 through 5 um, talks about the high priest called Joshua. And um, Joshua is actually the Hebrew word or pronunciation of the Greek word Jesus. So it's actually about Jesus. 
And in that, that passage, he, he was wearing filthy garments. Um, and the angel said, remove those filthy garments and put a clean turban on mm -hmm. his head. And so those filthy garments, so Jesus went before the Father with those filthy garments, bearing every sin on, on his body, every sin of the whole world. We see him as the sin bearer coming before God with filthy garments. And Father had to turn his face away from him. Now, this is something that the Holy Spirit um, audibly spoke to Roland, and he wrote it down. Because of the accusations of Satan and the daily reminders of sin, failure, and human weakness, you may forget what God has done. You must be reminded. You must remember. God, in his wisdom, has provided a time and a way for this to be accomplished. This is the purpose of his communion service, a time to remember what Jesus has done. Here he asks us to look upon his body to see your sin and the sins of the world placed upon him by God. Every lie, every sin against yourself or others, murder, all adultery, all immorality, all dishonesty, cheating, rebellion, idolatry, enmity through witchcraft and Satanism, everything with which you could be charged was laid on him. He has become sin for you, bearing in his body the concentrated dregs of the rottenness of billions of people. So he points to his body as you hold, as we're gonna hold in that cup um, to, to your sin and, and he tells you that your sin has already been judged you are free and as you behold him smitten of God with the searing strokes of his judgment you see there the cancelled sin of the world Jesus felt the fire of God's wrath so it wouldn't fall on us and with this reminder of your peace with him you can speed the message to the world you can come you have been accepted God's wrath has been turned away then he asks us to look at Jesus the high priest carrying his blood entering the very tabernacle of God in the heavens where the records of sin were cut. Not only the act of sin in our lives, but the records of it, the disobedience, the breaking of his laws and his covenant. And we see the high priest, he said, see him as he splashes his blood on the book of broken laws, upon the altar of the broken commandments, thus as a thick cloud blotting out forever the records of anything in heaven that's written in heaven that you could be charged with. Not only the act of sin as the evil of sin in this earth and in your life, but the records of it. So he said, as we see him doing that, we see him bringing to us a new covenant. And he points to the new, this new covenant. And what is the promise of the new covenant? Is that he will put his laws in our hearts and he will not remember our sins. He says, if their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. And he's turned sin into ashes. He's blotted out the records and given us a brand new covenant. So the, the, a little difference between the old and the new covenants the old there was pardon that that has to do with remembrance year after year the the high they god pardoned them but he still remembered what they did that message is not found in the new testament at all you can't find the word pardon in the concordance in the new testament it, it, the in the new it's justification which means just as if it had never happened in god's sight so there's no like ex murderers in heaven because god to, to, to god's viewpoint because he doesn't he doesn't remember it um, law and works in the Old Testament, now it's grace and faith. Conscience was spotted, now we got a clean conscience. We can go to bed with peace. We just check in with the Lord. And in the Old Testament, it's, I have to keep the law. In the New, it's I want to. He's put a I want to in our hearts. We want to obey God. We want to please God. Um, the blood of bulls and goats. Um, in the New, it's the blood of Christ. In the Old, God's glory dwelt in buildings, like tabernacle. Knew he dwells in us, his glory dwells in us. Um, and then people knew him from afar, and they knew we could know him up close. It's a way better covenant. Um, in the old, it was temporary because they had to do it year after year. In the new, it just happened once and it's done. <laughs> uh, communion time is for people who need release and deliverance from the bondage of anything the enemy would bring. When you take that emblem of that blood, you're telling the Lord, my faith is in this blood and what he's done. I thank you for blotting out as a thick cloud all of my transgression. You can look up into his face right now with nothing between your soul and your Savior, with the same innocence of a newborn child. As we take the energies that we have spent struggling with things and start turning them into letting our lives be a channel for his life to flow through, we'll be strong. And uh, when it talks about the uh, blotting out as a thick cloud, uh, one of the things they did in the Old Testament in, um, is they, in uh, Leviticus 16, 12, it says um, he had the incense 
had took a censer and, and the incense had to be had to be crushed. And then um, they would he would put hot coals on the incense that was crushed, and then that would make a cloud billow up, and that actually preserved his life. And um, it was a beautiful, sweet smell, and um, God could accept Aaron, you know, the high priest, and accept the people. You know, if he didn't do that, he would die. That's why they had to have a thing wrapped around his ankle, and they would drag him out if they didn't if he didn't do that um, incense cloud covering thing right. And so it represented what Jesus was going to do. Um, so Jesus was was beaten and crushed, and um, from that there was there was a cloud that billowed up from the cross. And it was uh, that the incense that covers all time and eternity and space. And everyone who puts their faith in what he did for, him, for, the, for, for us, then they become under that, that covering. And so the Father sees us through that beautiful covering and just has nothing but a smile. He just says, we, just, we look like Jesus to the Father. And, and he has a plan to remove the stuff in our lives as well. So we're not only covered, but he's also working on the underneath side of that covering of the process of sanctification. God desires to cover up your sins, and he has a plan of taking them all the way. And I, I, I mentioned about the two animals already. The lamb would be burned to ashes, and the live goat was taken out into the wilderness to nev never return again, to wander until he perished. Sins now blotted out as a thick cloud. These are, this is the power of the blood. All of their sins in the depths of the sea. That's Micah 7, 19. Their sins and iniquities I'll remember no more forever. That's Jeremiah 50, 20. God said we can come now because the blood has turned God's wrath away. That same spirit who raised Jesus from the dead will give us life now through the blood. Because the spirit comes when a person puts their faith in the blood. And it was the power of the blood that raised him from the dead. And his blood destroyed the power of death, hell, sin, and the devil. Because of what Jesus has done, the bands of sin, disease, depression, habit, any other type of a band is going to be broken as you look unto him. As you remember Jesus' death, as you put your faith in what he has done, you identify yourself with what he has done and become a partaker of his life. Then the life of Jesus can be seen in us. So let the Lord sprinkle your life with this truth. This is the last thing that the Holy Spirit spoke um, audibly to my uncle. He said, let the Lord sprinkle your life with this truth and it will pull from your conscience and minds those things that would trouble you and you can be free. It will purge your conscience from all of the filling of any dead works that you're trying to do to somehow lift yourself up so you can please God. So the atonement meanings, there's nine meanings. It means in coffer, it means to cover, to compensate for debt, and I'm gonna email this to you guys, to appease wrath, to cleanse, to cancel records, to forgive, to obtain mercy, to purge away, and to reconcile. So all, this is all the things that, it, uh, it covers it all. All in that one word, there's nine meanings. Um, he cancels the record. One time when my um, uncle was in the throne room and he saw Abraham's record book and, the, the fa and he, he asked the father, he said, where's his other book on Abraham? Because I don't see like any of the, the bad stuff that's even in the word about him, about when he lied about his wife being his sister. And, and the father said, I don't have another book. I do not record failure in heaven. He's washed it away through the blood. And the blood is kept. It's still there in heaven. When Paul went to heaven, he saw it. It's been preserved. And um, that's, and it's going to be, it's, it's an eternal reminder. The blood is constantly speaking. And it's saying not guilty on our behalf. He wants rivers of living water flowing, flowing through us. So sometimes things get in the way and block the channel of, of the life of Jesus flowing through us. And the, the definition of sanctification, one of them, is the adaptation of, 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 our, of our moral, of our being to the life of Jesus, to the power of the life of Jesus. So we, we need, if we have the life of Jesus flowing in us, we will, we will just want to love everybody. <laughs> and so if, sometimes we need to go and take communion if, and remember. And Peter talks about if you... If you, he who lacks these things, if there's a passage um, who, who doesn't have like love or whatever, then it says that has forgotten that their sins have been you know, blotted out and they need to go take communion. There's that diagram again um, that I mentioned about earlier. So, and then this is a little bit, of, I mentioned about the sweet incense. Here it is. He shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from off the altar before the Lord and his hands full of sweet incense, beaten, small, 
and bring it within the veil. And he, he shall put the incense upon the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat, that he die not. And then Paul mentions, walk in love as Christ has loved us and has given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling fragrance. So his sufferings, his, his, the beatings he went through have became a sweet-smelling fragrance on our behalf. So when the Father sees us and when, when we remember and we accept, then we look blameless to the Father. First Colossians 1.22 says, um, he's now through the death of Jesus when he's able to present us before the Father looking holy, blameless, and unreprovable in His sight, in the Father's sight. And because He's seeing us through that sweet-smelling fragrance, that, that covering. Here's a picture you can think about when we're taking communion. So, let's prepare to participate in celebration. When you take the broken bread in your hand, Visualize there those things that have been haunting you, if there has been anything haunting you. Visualize the things like the enemy has been accusing of you of and saying these are going to meet you in the judgment. This broken body is a horrible thing with every sin and the evilest life you could possibly imagine. It was all put on him. And if you're not sure your sins are all covered and you want to receive eternal life by faith through God's grace, you can join us audibly by faith as the way I talked about how to do it worthily during this time, and, um, and you will come to know the Lord. And um, we want to thank God together that he bore the judgment, and our sins that were there are nothing but empty ashes. So the next segment, I'm going to have some prayers that I want to, we can all pray together. Um, maybe we could pass out the cups now. So um, I, I put down some prayers like of praise and thanksgiving that um, I'll say and then you, we can you can repeat and then after these series of prayers then um, then we can just drink and eat after so so this is this is all part of it right now this this next time um, you can close your eyes if you want but you don't have to dear God thank you for tasting death for me dear God Jesus, thank you for bearing the wrath of God for my sin. Jesus, I accept what you've done for me. Thank you, Jesus, for giving me fresh strength for the journey. Thank you, Jesus, for demonstrating your love for me by dying on the cross for my sins, even when I was still your enemy. Praise you, Jesus, for removing my sins as far as the east is from the west. Praise you, Jesus, for removing my sins as far as the east is from the west. Thank you, Jesus, for sharing your wonderful life and nature with me. Thank you, Jesus, for sharing your wonderful life and nature with me. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for helping me to overcome through the blood of Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for helping me to overcome through the blood of Jesus. Thank you for your constant cleansing as I continue to walk with you and talk with you. I declare that through taking these symbols of your broken body and shed blood, that I am putting my faith and trust completely in what you have accomplished for me at the cross. And not in my own actions or abilities in any way. Thank you, Jesus, for adapting me to the power of the flow of your endless life. Thank you, Jesus, for inculcating your divine nature within me. Thank you, Father, for providing for all of my needs through the sacrifice of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for destroying the roots of every sin that has been held against me. Thank you, Jesus, for unclogging the rivers of your living water within me. Thank you, Jesus, for the river of your life that brings joy to your city and people. Thank you, Jesus, for the river of your life that brings joy to your city and people. 
Thank you, Jesus, for removing the records of my sin. Jesus, we celebrate and proclaim the benefits of your life, death, and resurrection for us. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for restoring us to a place of oneness of spirit and communion between us. Thank you, Jesus, for spoiling the principalities and powers of darkness. And totally stripping them of all of their authority to accuse us for our sins that have already been judged. Thank you, Jesus, for conquering death and defeating the devil. Thank you, Jesus, for removing the stains and guilt of my past failures and sins. Praise you, Jesus, for purging my conscience from all accusations and condemnation through the power of your blood. Thank you for making me a channel for your life to flow through. Praise you, Jesus, for restoring me to a place of total innocence before you. Thank you, Father, that you see me looking just exactly as though my past sins had never happened. Thank you that for all of eternity, you will see me looking blameless. Thank you, Jesus, for a new beginning every morning and since the day I accepted you. Thank you, Jesus, for entering into a covenant with me that will never be broken. I praise you and thank you, Lord Jesus, for bearing all of my sorrows and emotional baggage. By faith, I release forgiveness to myself and everyone who has ever hurt me. And if I have any bitter roots towards anyone, I thank you for the power of your endless life to help me forgive and be healed. Father, thank you that through Jesus' sacrifice, my soul is whole. Father, I, I celebrate and receive deposits of your love and life because Jesus died for me to receive it. Father, thank you for freeing me from whatever deposits were made in my soul that were not from you. Thank you that there is now no condemnation for me because I am in Christ. By faith through the blood of Jesus, with an act of my will, I choose right now to loose any darkness, any addiction, any anger, any fear, any of the enemy, regardless of how it got there. Leave my soul now in Jesus' name. I praise you, Jesus, and celebrate the full benefits of your sacrifice, which includes healing and health for my body, soundness in my mind, and peace in my soul and spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for invading my life and family and sphere with the life of Jesus and heaven through his blood and this communion time. I am covered. I am forgiven. I am cleansed. I am saved and being saved. I am sanctified and becoming sanctified. Hallelujah. 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 All right, let's partake of the body. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, that was kind of the ministry time, what we just did. <laughs> <laughs>